Hello, everyone, and sorry for this uh, little delay due to some uh, email and internet issues. So I hope I kept most of you online. And I'm very excited to introduce today Catherine Girard for our uh, inaugural fall semester seminar. So Catherine is finishing her uh, PhD at University of Montreal in co-supervision between Marc Amio and Jesse Shapiro. Her background is really in Arctic immunology, but her research interests have, have uh, evolved throughout her graduate studies. So while her PhD is mostly focused on, on mercury cycling in Arctic ecosystems, she really uh, uh, changed her interest from the environment into the human body with a special interest in food chemistry uh, and molecular biology. And I believe this is what she will be talking to us about today. She's also interested in science communication and on issues of research decolonization in the North. Catherine has been a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Texas, Austin for a year, uh, working with Nancy Moran on pesticides on the microbiome of honeybees. And she's about to uh, start a uh, Sentinel North postdoctoral fellowship at Université Laval with Alexander Kelly and Caroline Duchesne. I'm very excited to have Catherine talk today. And I think you can share your screen and get going. Thanks, Catherine. All right. Thanks, Alex, for uh, the introduction. Can everyone hear me all right? This is good? Everything looks great. Perfect. Um, so again, thanks, Alex, for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for tuning in. Uh, so my name is Catherine. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Montreal. And today I'll be uh, presenting some results from my, uh, my PhD that are about how uh, the way we prepare our food and how our gut microbiomes can change the fate of uh, mercury in the body. And we'll try to answer the question of uh, should you be eating sushi or fish and chips? So as you probably know, uh, mercury is a major environmental concern. Um, it does have a few um, natural sources, uh, things like erosion and volcanic eruptions, but most modern emissions are related to human activity. And we can see this in this uh, figure where we have a sharp increase in emissions following the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so currently, most mercury in the, uh, that's emitted into the environment is from human sources. And these will include things like coal combustion, uh, metal smelting, or chloroalkyl facilities. Now, we're worried about mercury because it can be toxic uh, to biota and to humans, and especially when it's in its form of methylmercury. Uh, methylmercury is produced by bacteria in uh, aquatic sediments, for example, and methylmercury is a special concern because it's a neurotoxin that can easily bioaccumulate in the body. Uh, it can cross the blood-brain barrier and cause a whole health of uh, a host of health issues. So we're pretty interested in methylmercury. And in humans, the main uh, route of exposure to this contaminant is through diet and mostly through fish. Uh, methylmercury can easily bind uh, to sulfur-rich proteins in fish and uh, bioaccumulate through food webs. So uh, it can also bio biomagnify through food webs. And what that means is if we look at this figure, we see that lower trophic level fish contain some mercury. But as you go up towards uh, larger predatory fish, mercury, methylmercury concentrations tend to rise. So the presence of methylmercury in fish is problematic because, okay, we know that uh, fish can be contaminated, but we can't just write off uh, the consumption of fish because it's also a very healthy source of protein. Uh, it's uh, very rich in vitamins and minerals and fatty acids. It's really a super high quality protein option. And there's also evidence that fish consumption can have a protective effect against things like cardiovascular disease. So we can't just tell people to not eat fish because they might be contaminated. And uh, methylmercury contamination in fish is also an issue because a lot of people don't have a choice but to rely on fish as a protein source. So here we have a map of uh, subsistence catch in indigenous and coastal populations all around the world. And although the highlighted areas uh, in the coastal regions that you see here include seafood and fish, uh, fish represents the major part uh, of catches. So a lot of people in coastal and indigenous groups uh, will depend on fish and to these people, the presence of mercury and methylmercury can become a pretty big problem. Uh, this is also true in the Arctic, where I've done most of my work. Um, this is because the uh, traditional diet of the Inuit can include marine mammals. And although I've mostly talked about fish up until now, uh, 
unfortunately, methylmercury can also bioaccumulate in uh, aquatic mammals. So this has led the Inuit to, to having uh, very high blood mercury levels, especially when compared to Southerners at our uh, urbanized latitudes, but even compared to other Northern populations. And again, here we're faced with the fact that this traditional diet, which includes uh, fish, but also mammals such as uh, whales and seals, is very healthy. It's uh, a great source of vitamins and minerals, and we can't tell people to uh, not eat it, especially uh, because of its great social and cultural significance in the North. So since mercury is a big issue and affects so many people, and we can't just write off the consumption of organisms that might be contaminated, uh, we have to try and figure out a way to uh, balance out the risks of mer methylmercury exposure and the benefits associated with fish or marine mammal consumption, and try and find some middle ground. So to try and protect people from exposing themselves to too much mercury and methylmercury, um, guidelines and recommendations have been put into place by governments or by the World Health Organization, for example. And these guidelines um, emit recommendations uh, that you don't eat too much fish to limit the amount of methylmercury you're exposed to. Um, but we're realizing more and more that these guidelines might be a little problematic. Um, first, these guidelines are mostly based on mercury concentration in fish, and they assume that all the mercury that is in fish is in the form of toxic methylmercury. Uh, more importantly, uh, these guidelines assume that 100% of methylmercury is absorbed by the body. Uh, however, this number of 100% comes to us from older studies that were conducted in the 60s and in the 70s, which are now being disputed. So it would seem that orally ingested methylmercury might not be completely absorbed by the body. So these guidelines might not be adequately representing what is actually uh, being transferred from the gut into systemic circulation during uh, absorption. Uh, this is pretty important because um, the models that we use right now to predict methylmercury accumulation patterns in uh, humans don't work really well for everyone. Um, they're actually not ideal predictors in indigenous populations uh, like the Inuit. So, Clearly, we're missing um, a level of information, and we have to ask ourselves, how can we improve these guidelines and these models? Uh, can we figure out if methylmercury is totally absorbed? Can we see, try and understand why different populations might not well be described by these models? So to answer this question, uh, what we've been trying to do is uh, trying to identify what variables could be changing the fate of methylmercury in the body. Um, so we consider different things that could affect uh, how methylmercury behaves once it's in the gut and in the human body, uh, and these factors are all currently not included in uh, guidelines and recommendations for consumption. So for example, the way you prepare your fish uh, might have an impact on methylmercury, and this isn't considered right now by guidelines. So while some people might be really, really into sushi, uh, most of us will eat our fish once it's been cooked, and cooking can induce some pretty dramatic protein conformation changes um, and protein folding that could change the way that methylmercury binds to it, and this could alter its fate in the body. Uh, another factor to consider is that we rarely eat fish alone. It's typically part of a meal that will include other foods and beverages, and these compounds could also interact with methylmercury in our GI tract. And finally, there's also the gut microbiome uh, that should be considered. So our bodies are hosts to these hugely abundant and diverse microbial ecosystems, and in the environment, bacteria are the main drivers of mercury and methylmercury transformations. So we have to figure out if the bacteria that are living in our bodies could do the same thing to methylmercury that we ingest with our food. So all of these factors, these dietary practices in the gut microbiome could potentially uh, change the way that uh, mercury is complexed in the body. It could change the way its oxidation state or its species. And uh, these are all factors that could change the ability of methylmercury to be absorbed by the body. And all of these factors, again, are not included in current risk assessments for methylmercury. So the objective of my PhD was to try and figure out how these variables can change the way methylmercury behaves in the human body, and ultimately to try and see if it might affect the way that we absorb it. So I'll start by talking a bit about uh, dietary practices and how di they might influence mercury absorption. Uh, and to do this, we used in vitro measures of bioaccessibility. So 
briefly, bioaccessibility is defined as the fraction of a contaminant that is solubilized in the uh, GI tract and the digestive fluids. So this makes uh, this means that solubilization is a precursor to absorption. The contaminant has to be solubilized from the fish muscle in order to be absorbed. So bioaccessibility is a conservative measure of bioavailability. And it's an interesting tool to use for this kind of preliminary work because it can uh, be easily measured in in vitro simulators of the human gut. And uh, the in vitro model that we used was adapted from the physiologically based extraction test. It includes uh, a gastric and an intestinal uh, phase. So what happens is a uh, food sample will go through the simulator, will be digested in an environment that simulates what happens in the body, so through an enzymes, pH, temperature, and um, peristalsis. And following digestion, we obtain um, a digestate from which we isolate the soluble fraction of methylmercury, which we define as bioaccessible. Now from this, uh, we can repeat our uh, simulated digestions by treating food samples, uh, by cooking our fish, for example, or co-digesting it with other compounds. And um, this will give us an idea of how these dietary practices affect bioaccessibility. So this is uh, how I'll be presenting the results to you. You'll notice that we've normalized all our controls, so the first bar here to 100%. Uh, we did this because we wanted to be able to control for between simulation variability. So the y-axis here shows percent loss of bioaccessibility. And the results that I'll be showing you were um, uh, are from experiments that were done in four different types of fish. Uh, we selected these species because they were readily available to consumers um, in supermarkets year-round. So I'll start by uh, showing you some results about the effects of cooking on bioaccessibility. And uh, I'll be presenting uh, results as an example from only one species. So here we see that uh, our control, which is our raw fish sample that went through our simulator, uh, we normalized methylmercury bioaccessibility in that sample to 100%. And what we see is that once you cook your fish, either through grilling, through frying, or through boiling, you uh, lose a significant amount of bioaccessible methylmercury. Uh, what we also found is that if you increase temperatures uh, for grilling and frying, or if you uh, lengthen the amount of time that you uh, let your fish boil, there is a slight um, proportional effect. It's not quite significant, but it seems that increased temperatures will lead to a, a bit less methylmercury remaining bioaccessible. Uh, now, this is a general trend that we observed in all the fish species that we tested, and it suggests that cooking could significantly reduce methylmercury bioaccessibility. Um, this uh, kind of result agrees with um, other authors in the literature who've observed similar effects in different types of fish, uh, so our results join theirs. Um, and this opens up the question um, of why this is happening. So we still have to explore this. We haven't had uh, we haven't gotten a chance to look into it, but we are really interested in figuring out why cooking leads to methylmercury being less solubilized from the fish muscle. Um, it's, our hypothesis is it's possible that conformation changes in fish mus muscle protein uh, that occur at high temperatures might alter protein folding, and this could mask enzymatic uh, cleavage sites, which could reduce the ability of methylmercury to be released from the fish matrix. Uh, so this is something that we can't quite um, uh, speak on for now, but we're interested in looking more into it in the future. Uh, next, we repeated our in vitro simulations, but this time instead of cooking fish, uh, we co-digested it with foods and dried beverages. Um, we mostly tested foods that are foods and beverages that are rich in polyphenols uh, because other authors in the literature have previously reported these compounds to be uh, able to impact methylmercury bioaccessibility. Uh, and basically, polyphenols are a very broad family of small aromatic compounds that are derived from plants, and you find them pretty much everywhere in the typical human diet. And uh, we started by testing uh, the effects of tea, so green and black tea, which are high in polyphenols, uh, we verified their effect on swordfish. And what we found is that uh, by adding these compounds, you lead to less methylmercury being, uh, being bioaccessible, and the effect seems to be proportionate to the amount of dried beverage that is adding. So the more tea you add, the less methylmercury is bioaccessible. 
Uh, this is also something we saw in other fish species that we tested, like tuna. And we also found that uh, coffee and instant coffee had a similar effect, so there was a slight reduction by accessibility, but it wasn't quite as pronounced as what we were seeing for uh, black and green tea. Um, and finally, not all the foods that we added uh, had an impact on bioaccessibility. Uh, we used cornstarch as a negative control because it's, uh, it doesn't contain any polyphenols. And we did this to make sure that it wasn't just the act of adding something to our simulation that would automatically reduce bioaccessibility. And indeed, in this case, our negative control of cornstarch did not significantly impact uh, methylmercury solubilization. So from these results, uh, we uh, infer that polyphenols seem to be responsible for the decreased methylmercury bioaccessibility we're seeing, since uh, foods that have no polyphenols are not having an effect. Uh, this agrees with other authors from the literature who found that tea, for example, could limit uh, inorganic mercury bioaccessibility. However, uh, not all the polyphenol-rich foods that we tested worked. So I don't have these bars on, on uh, this graph, but we also tested berries like blueberries, for example, which have very high polyphenol content, but these berries had no effect on bioaccessibility. So it seems like not all the polyphenols uh, have the potential to impact mercury solubilization. And this is pretty interesting because up till now in the literature, most people uh, have observed that have observed results like this attribute them to polyphenols in general. Um, but polyphenols are a very broad category of molecules, and we figured that we could try and uh, find out which compounds specifically were actually limiting methylmercury bioaccessibility. So to do this, uh, we started by measuring the different polyphenol contents in the co-foods that we tested in our simulations, so in every type of tea, of coffee, and in our negative controls. Um, and then we identified the major polyphenols that were discriminant between these categories. So we tried to find the compounds that were most abundant in tea uh, and to a certain extent in coffee because these were the compounds that, have, that had the greater effect. And from there, we repeated our in vitro simulation experiments, but this time, instead of adding powdered tea or powdered coffee, we used these uh, purified compounds. And what we found um, is, first off, that cathokins that are frequently cited in the literature as being responsible for uh, the decrease in methylmercury bioaccessibility, well, we found that they didn't really have an effect in our experiments on swordfish, uh, so that was pretty interesting. However, uh, when we tested other compounds, we were able to identify several of them that were abundant in green and black teas and that did limit methylmercury bioaccessibility in their purified form. So we uh, identified, for example, gallic acid and other variants of cathokins like epigallocathokin gallate or rutin uh, as being able to limit methylmercury solubilization. And once again, uh, the effect appears to be proportional with increasing amounts of the compounds. So we were able to confirm for the first time that polyphenols are in fact responsible for the effect that tea has on methylmercury bioaccessibility. Um, as to why we're seeing this effect, well, these polyphenolic compounds are known to have chelating properties towards certain metals, so that might be why we're seeing this effect, but this is something that we uh, still have to investigate with the uh, speciation analyses and that we haven't had a, a chance to look into. Um, finally, for uh, dietary practices, we also tested how both uh, dietary uh, tools could influence methylmercury bioaccessibility. So here again, I'm showing you our results in swordfish, and we have our control raw sample that was digested alone, normalized to 100% bioaccessibility. And just as a quick recap, if I show you uh, just cooking results, we see that Either grilling, frying, or boiling our fish leads to significant decreases in methylmercury bioaccessibility. If we uh, only use raw swordfish and we digest it with black tea, we find that the more tea we add, the less methylmercury is bioaccessible. Now, when we combine both cooking and bioaccessibility, what we find is that they uh, together can lead to decreases of uh, bioaccessible methylmercury by up to 99%. So when we either grill, fry, or boil our fish and digest it with 120 milligrams of black tea, you're left with barely any methylmercury left bioaccessible, but there is still some left. 
And just for reference, 120 milligrams of black tea is about uh, a cup and a half of a prepared tea that you would drink. So we also observed the same trend when we looked at our results for uh, swordfish that had been cooked and co-digested with gallic acid, so a purified polyphenol uh, compound. Uh, again, this is uh, a trend that we observed in all the species that we, uh, we tested and leads us to conclude that cooking and polyphenols both have a strong effect together on bioaccessibility, but that there is some methylmercury that remains uh, bioaccessible, so it doesn't just disappear. Um, so this is pretty interesting because it suggests that cooking and polyphenol-rich foods could potentially affect uh, methylmercury absorption because, again, as I mentioned before, uh, methylmercury needs to be rendered bioaccessible before being bioavailable and thus absorbed by the body. So uh, these dietary practices could potentially affect the fate of methylmercury in the body. So up until now, uh, I've shown you that cooking and these uh, co-ingested polyphenol-rich foods could uh, reduce methylmercury. It might have an effect on absorption, but obviously uh, these results are based on an in vitro, very simplified model. Uh, and we can't uh, infer amended guidelines right away from these results. We really need to validate these results uh, with bioavailability assays or in vivo studies uh, before we start, we start modifying guidelines and recommendations. Uh, however, uh, these results do have value because they point us in the direction of easy to implement solutions to reduce meth uh, methylmercury absorption in the body, and they help us. Um, they can help us design uh, in vivo studies that are quite costly and ethically loaded, uh, and we can, from these preliminary uh, results, we can inform these studies better. And ultimately, that could help us uh, amend guidelines. Um, and the next aspect I'd like to focus on now, uh, leaving dietary practices uh, for now, is the gut microbiome, which has been getting a lot of attention recently. Now, as you probably know, our bodies are covered in trillions of bacteria, and the most densely populated part of our body is our gut. Um, and these bacteria are highly diversified, they're metabolically active, and they have a huge number of genes. And they're really involved in host health in a ton of different ways. And some of these uh, the services that are uh, rendered to us by our microbiome can include uh, digestion in general. So our uh, microbiomes help us extract more energy from the food that we intake, because some of the things that we eat uh, cannot be digested by our enzymes alone. Uh, the microbiome also helps us develop our immune system, helps us protect us from pathogens and maintain a healthy gut lining. Um, and our microbiome is also involved in how we metabolize uh, medication so it can have an impact on the treatments, the medical treatments that we're taking. Uh, finally, there's some really fascinating sort of out there research going on uh, uh, happening on the gut microbiome and the brain axis. And this type of research is showing that the microbiome could potentially affect personality, behavior, and might be involved with diseases like depression. So the world of microbiome research is very, very active. It's fascinating. Uh, but obviously what I'm most uh, interested in here is how the microbiome might be interacting with contaminants that we ingest in our food. Now, there are two different ways of approaching this question. Uh, we can look at how the microbiome can metabolize or transform contaminants. And there's some evidence um, that the gut bacteria can transform some, uh, some metals. So these studies, for example, were performed in simulators of the human gut that also simulate the gut microbiome. So I believe this was in the Shime system. Um, and these studies have shown that uh, gut bacteria can actually increase uh, arsenic bioaccessibility and can transform other contaminants, other metals, and uh, lead to their biovolatilization. So the microbiome might also be able to transform methylmercury. We also have to think about how inversely contaminants could be altering the microbiome. Uh, this uh, study came out last year, I believe, and was really interesting, showed that chronic exposure to lead in drinking water can lead to altered metabolism in the gut microbiome, which in turn can affect how the microbiome contributes to host health through these pathways. Uh, this type of uh, research is obviously really 
interesting, of great relevance for um, people in Flint in Michigan, for example, who have been faced uh, with a, an ongoing water crisis with lead contamination. Uh, but it can also uh, inform us on why this is important for the Inuit. So if the Inuit have a diet that exposes them to more dietary methylmercury, could this exposure be altering their microbiome? And can their microbiome transform or metabolize methylmercury and ultimately affect its bioaccessibility? So this is uh, the second big question that was, I was interested in in my PhD. Uh, but before tackling this, we had to figure out what uh, is the Inuit microbiome? And this is an important question because uh, different populations from around the world will have distinct uh, gut microbial communities. And that's because the types of species, the community structure that we're, we see in microbiomes are mostly driven by diet. So people from around the world tend to eat differently and that will shape their own individual microbiomes. Uh, what's unfortunate here is that uh, we don't have a lot of knowledge on what indigenous microbiomes look like. Um, these uh, human groups are typically poorly represented in uh, biomolecular research in general, but especially in the world of the microbiome. So the first thing we had to do was to try and describe what the, microbi the Inuit microbiome is. And uh, this was interesting because the Inuit diet is very unique, and diet is such an important driver of community composition. Uh, briefly, the Inuit microbiome is uh, the Inuit diet, sorry, is uh, enriched in animal fats and proteins. It's uh, dependent mostly on hunting, on gathering, and on fishing. It's pretty depleted in uh, fiber uh, content. And as I mentioned before, the Inuit diet is really, really nutritious. It's a great source of vitamins, of minerals, of fatty acids, but it can also be a source of mercury and methylmercury, especially through the marine mammals and the fish that can be consumed as part of this diet. Uh, the last thing to know about uh, this diet for this part of the talk is that the Inuit diet is also undergoing severe changes. Um, the North is going through a dietary transition, meaning that a lot of people are transitioning away from a more traditional lifestyle to a more westernized uh, lifestyle. So the modern Inuit diet is actually supplemented with some market food similar to what we would consume in the South. So using this information about the Inuit diet and trying to explore the uh, Inuit microbiome, we presented the first uh, description of the gut communities of uh, this population, which we recently uh, published in Msphere, if anyone's interested in checking out that paper. And briefly, what we did here um, to perform the study is we collected stool samples from a small community in Nunavut uh, from individuals consuming a traditional Inuit diet. We also uh, sampled Inuit individuals who had a fairly westernized diet as controls. Uh, we isolated the DNA in the, the bacterial DNA in these stool samples and performed two types of uh, analyses. We did amplicon sequencing on uh, an Illumina platform to assess taxonomic composition, so the types of species of bacteria present in these samples and their abundances. And we also did shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which uh, sequences every gene present in the sample. And this gives us an idea of the metabolism or the functional pathways that could potentially be present in these microbiomes. And briefly, what we found um, at first surprised us. We saw that uh, the Inuit microbiome was overall similar to microbiomes of individuals of Western descent. So here we have a PCOA of microbiomes from our study, but we also included samples that are from um, the literature from all over the world. And here, each point is one microbiome of one individual, and we're comparing these samples based on the types of species and the abundances that are found in each of these samples. And what we see is that Nunavut samples from our study cluster closely with Montrealers, but also with other North Americans and Europeans. So this suggests that the Inuit microbiome is a uh, pretty similar to that of Westerners from urbanized latitudes. Now, we um, believe that this might be due to the dietary transitioning happening right now in the North. People are relying increasingly on market foods, and that might be what is driving the similarity that we're seeing here. However, um, there were some differences when we started looking at our samples a bit more closely. Uh, we found um, that when we 
repeated this analysis for metabolic pathways, so for the functions, the genes that are present in these microbiomes. Uh, the traditional Inuit diet significantly explained a portion of variation that we found. So we do see an, uh, an effect of diet on the metabolism of the microbiome. Uh, furthermore, when we uh, performed strain level analyses on these samples, we found that the Inuit uh, tend to have, for example, less uh, diversity in the bacteria that are responsible for fiber degradation, which makes sense. Uh, our cohort consumed a lot less fiber than other groups. Uh, they also contained less bacteria associated with citrus fruit or with dairy product consumption. This, again, makes sense from the interviews that we conducted with our participants. We found that these uh, kinds of products were not readily available to them year-round. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Inuit in general seem to have more bacteria that are typically associated with meat consumption. So from this, uh, we, we infer that although the Inuit microbiome is overall similar to Westerners, it is definitely shaped by the traditional Inuit diet in subtle but significant ways. And so the next question we need to ask here is whether methylmercury in the Inuit diet could be driving uh, any of these differences, if it could be contributing to any of the patterns that we're seeing. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have mercury exposure or mercury blood levels uh, from our participants in our cohort. So we can't answer this question directly, uh, but this would be a very interesting research avenue to explore to see if people who are exposed to more methylmercury with their traditional diet uh, have a differently shaped microbiome community. What we did explore, however, was how the microbiome might be interacting with methylmercury that is going into the body. So from our shotgun metagenomic uh, sequencing, we annotated all the genes that were present uh, using databases, and we tried to see if we could find any genes that are involved in mercury or methylmercury metabolism uh, in these Inuit microbiomes. And we focused on uh, three main uh, pathways. So we uh, first looked for HGCAB, which is a gene group that is responsible for methylating inorganic mercury into methylmercury. We also looked for the MERB gene, uh, which demethylates methylmercury back into its inorganic form. And finally, we looked uh, for MERA, which is a reductase. So it reduces inorganic mercury 2 into volatile mercury 0. These pathways occur environmentally and uh, are pretty well known. That's why we have access to sequences for these genes in, uh, in our databases. Um, mercury methylation, demethylation, and uh, reduction occur in soils and sediments and water columns. Uh, so they're fairly uh, well understood. What's uh, interesting about considering them from a microbiome or human standpoint is that uh, these transformations toggle mercury between species that are differently absorbed by the body. So while methylmercury, as I mentioned, is highly toxic and probably well absorbed by the body, inorganic mercury is less bioavailable and uh, mercury zero is barely uh, absorbed at all in the gut. So if the microbiome can transform mercury through any of these genetic pathways, then this could have an impact on uh, how mercury is absorbed in the body. If uh, methylmercury is demethylated or if it's produced and transformed into uh, volatile mercury zero, then that could significantly reduce bioavailability. Um, now there has been some interest in the past uh, in these genes and animal microbiomes, uh, but up till now, methylation genes have only been uh, identified in one species of fish and have never been found in humans. Um, similarly, uh, mer b hasn't been found. mer a however, which uh, catalyzes the reduction of mercury into volatile mercury zero, has been identified um, in mice, in monkeys that were um, equipped with dental uh, amalgams, or uh, in stool incubations. So this suggests that there might be potential mercury reduction happening. Um, but here we figured that with our cohort that is theoretically more exposed to dietary mercury than the other humans surveyed in these studies, uh, we might get a stronger signal and get a better understanding of how mercury might be transformed by uh, the gut bac bacteria. So first, uh, we parsed all of our annotated genes for any sign of any signs of mercury methylation through the HGCAB, and we found no significant hits. So that means uh, that it is unlikely that HGCAB is found in our sample. 
Uh, we also extended our search to a couple hundred uh, samples from the Human Microbiome Project, which is a huge initiative um, uh, from the United States, which includes microbiomes from people all over the US and from elsewhere in the world. And again, we found no HGCA hits. So this leads us to confirm what other studies have shown, that it seems unlikely that this gene is present in the human microbiome. Um, however, it's important to consider that we're basing this analysis from databases uh, that include genes that are from the environment. So it's possible that HGCA might be present in the human microbiome, but might have diverged so much that we're not seeing it as a hit when we compare it to the sequences that we have in our databases. Uh, it's also possible that other genes could be catalyzing mercury methylation, but for now we don't know. At least um, we have pretty strong support for uh, this conclusion that HGCA, as we know it, is not present in human microbiomes. Um, then we looked for uh, the presence of MERB, which catalyzes the demethylation of methylmercury. And again, we found no hits. Uh, again, this might be due to sequence diversion, uh, diversion, divergence, excuse me, or maybe because the gene is truly absent. We're not quite sure for now. What we did find, however, were several uh, significant hits for the mer gene. So again, this is the reductase that transforms inorganic mercury 2 into volatile mercury 0. Um, this gene was present in all but one of our Inuit samples, and we also found it in about half of the samples from the Human Microbiome Project that we surveyed. Now, um, MER-A and MER-B, actually, are part of um, a genetic organization called an operon. Uh, this uh, MER operon catalyzes mercury resistance in bacteria. The uh, reduction portion of the, uh, of the operon allows bacteria to bind mercury outside uh, the cellular environment, transfer it through the membrane, and then reduce it via this uh, MER-A reductase into volatile mercury zero. And mercury zero uh, can passively diffuse out of cells. So this is a resistance mechanism in bacteria. We didn't find MER-B in our operon, but we did find MER-A in almost all of our samples. And what I haven't mentioned uh, yet is that we also found uh, significant hits for the associated proteins that allow for the transport and the binding of mercury uh, through this pathway. So this suggests that there uh, might be potential for mercury reduction into mercury zero by the microbiome. Now this is interesting again because mercury zero is much less bioavailable and less toxic. Now I've mentioned before uh, that most um, mercury uh, in fish is in the form of methylmercury. So this ability to reduce inorganic mercury into mercury zero might not be that biologically interesting for fish consumers, but it could be important for the Inuits because uh, they are exposed to other, uh, they are exposed not only to methylmercury, but to other species of mercury through their diet. So for the typical fish consumer, we're mostly exposed to methylmercury in our diet, but the Inuit will also consume other organs than muscle, things like livers, uh, that can contain high levels of mercury too. So the presence of this pathway might not be important to most people, but for a population like the Inuit, it could have uh, some biological relevance. Uh, now, in any case, for now, we don't uh, know the quantified impact of this gene. Uh, we don't know if it has any biological effect on mercury absorption. So to do this, uh, the next step would be to use simulators of the human microbiome, things like the SHIME, uh, which could help us calculate the actual impact of this gene on bioaccessibility. But for now, uh, this appears to be a promising uh, research avenue. So uh, to conclude, um, we've shown that uh, different dietary practices can significantly impact the way uh, mercury is released from food. We've seen that cooking can significantly reduce the amount of methylmercury that is bioaccessible in different species of fish. We've also found that polyphenol-rich foods like teas uh, and to some extent coffee can have a smaller but significant impact. And we've identified specific polyphenolic compounds that are driving this effect. Uh, and we've also noted that these two dietary practices to, can act together to limit uh, in vitro methylmercury bioaccessibility by up to 99%. Again, there's always a tiny bit of methylmercury left. Uh, finally, we found no evidence for changes to methylmercury bioaccessibility by the microbiome, but the fact that we did find the mer operon 
could suggest that the microbiome could be interacting with inorganic mercury and altering its, avail its, um, its bioaccessibility. So all in all, these results uh, could be useful to inform future research into uh, improving our guidelines. Obviously, we absolutely have to verify and validate these results in in vivo settings to um, include systemic effects. So an example of um, a bias that this kind of in vitro study has is for the effect of tea. Uh, now, in our study, we saw that tea reduces bioaccessibility pretty significantly. Uh, but tea has also been found to accelerate enterohepatic cycling, which uh, at the whole body level could lead to a release of mercury that is stored in the liver back into systemic circulation. So obviously this kind of study doesn't provide us with a full picture yet, but it does give us clues as to how we could continue this research into one day altering guidelines. This is pretty interesting as well for indigenous populations like the Inuit who are exposed to more mercury and more methylmercury than we are. Um, if we can validate these practices, well, these could become non-invasive ways of protecting people while encouraging traditional practices of hunting and fishing. Uh, so finally, uh, I'll finish here uh, to answer the question in my title, should you eat sushi or fish and chips? Well, as far as these in vitro results go, fish and chips might not be great for your fat intake, but it could help protect you more from methylmercury, especially if you pair it with a cup of tea. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for uh, listening and listening in uh, today. I'd like to thank all the research partners, my uh, supervisors, as well as all the funding agencies, and I'll be happy to take any questions.